Just go for it! <laughs> Hey everybody, it's me, your buddy Dave, the host here at The Dark Stuff. Welcome to my uh, newest video. This is going to be uh, just a couple of recent acquisitions that I picked up. Some brand new stuff like new releases and then just some old stuff that I, I found used. Um, and a bit of a cautionary tale. I'm going to give some advice if you're thinking about picking something up. Um, and we're going to just jump right, right into it. Okay, so... Most of you guys probably understand that Husker Du is one of my favorite bands of all time. I just did a big tribute video to Grant Hart when he passed away uh, a month or so ago. And this is a band that's been consistently with me since the 1980s when I first started getting into them. They were one of my gateway bands kind of in when I'm transferring sort of uh, uh, between like being kind of a metal kid when I was young into sort of a punk rock indie kind of guy when I hit high school and and college and and beyond so obviously i was pretty fucking excited when uh it was announced that they were going to finally have a who's could do box set now there are a couple of caveats with the box set and that it is not career inclusive by any means uh the box set is called savage young do and this is it right here this is the cd version which is the one that i got Okay, it's a CD version, there's a vinyl version, there's an MP3 version that you can download, although do I honestly don't understand why anyone would do that, but that's neither here nor there. So, what this is, what the Savage Young Do is, that's upside down, isn't it? No, I think it's right side up. What the, what the Savage Young Do is, is this is all of their pre-SST stuff. They signed to SST, and their first EP for the label Metal Circus came out in 1983, but Husker Du formed as a band in 1979. So a lot of this is demos, unreleased stuff from that period, live recordings, some just home basement recordings, plus their debut album, Land Speed Record, which was initially released uh, on their own Reflex label and then put out again on New Alliance and then later on SST, plus their uh, 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 first studio full length because Land Speed Record is a live record. They put out a record called Everything Falls Apart, and that's on here too. Um, so it's those studio albums plus a couple of released singles, Statues and Amusement. That's their first uh, ever single, stuff like that. So I would say in the box set, it's about you know 60% previously released stuff, but it's just all sort of compiled in one place. Everything Falls Apart was reissued a couple of years ago with a lot of this stuff as bonus tracks too. Uh, stuff from that period, from like 82, 83. So that's my long-winded way of, of saying about the box set that um, this is for real Husker Du fans who have been, who have everything else and who want to delve even deeper into the band, uh, including a lot of stuff that, that you know, they, they didn't release for a reason because they were really young and there was amateurish recordings and stuff. And, and it's only interesting to see in the novelty of like where this band went by just like a year later, they were so much better. And here's this little rudimentary tune. But anyways, my cautionary tale is this. Okay, the box set is awesome. Okay, it's three CDs and they're put in these nice little like cutaways, which is sort of like um, the little Husker Du design one in the front it's an amazing uh picture book with tons and tons of information and uh gig posters a really really excellent um okay this part husker tunes this is the explanation of where all the songs come from and it's done by this guy paul hillkoff i know him the band considers him the official archivist okay so that's why he was included on this package he also included a lot of uh you know he's the one with the where every single date was and he can tell you about the set list for every show so the package is really really cool okay but i should have got the vinyl version okay 
Now, I didn't for a couple of reasons. One, I didn't order it directly from the Numero Group. That's the label that, that put the, the package out. It's a reissue label from Chicago. They put out some cool shit. They were doing this traveling store concept where they would pop into different cities and set up a store for a day and you could come in and buy all their stuff from their catalog. Well, this was a, a month or two ago and the Savage Young Do box set wasn't out already, so I didn't go to the thing thinking, well, why would they be selling it there? It's not coming out for another month and a month or so. Well, then a friend of mine told me that they were selling it there and so I should have probably gone to that. I'd have had the thing a month ago, but I didn't. There's a big discrepancy in price between vinyl and CD, as there always is. But when I went to the Numero Group's website, they claimed that the whole thing was sold out um, and they were doing a second pressing of the vinyl that wouldn't be coming out until December. And so you, they were taking pre-orders for that second pressing. And on Amazon, I swear to God, they probably, they've probably changed it by now, but when I looked at the the picture of what you were buying, you know, and you click for expanded view and it opens up. I swear to God, they must have been showing the vinyl packaging because it looked LP size. And so I thought to myself, well, the box sets are all the same. It's just instead of vinyl, they put it in, put CDs in there. So I'm like, well, that's pretty good. Then I still get the digital. I get the cool packaging, whatever. Well, that's not true. The box is, is you know, the CD box is much, much smaller, but, um, I'm still happy that I got it. I am contemplating buying it on vinyl again, you know, uh, but it's already priced like so high because it was meant to be a limited edition set. So let's talk about uh, beyond that, my screw up in buying the CD box and, uh, and get into what's actually the actual music on here. I mean, like I said earlier in the in the video while describing it, some of this stuff is from like 1979 through 80, 81, before they made an album, and they are really, really rough demos and really, really early songs. And some of them are very good, and some of them are not. You know, they're 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 pretty average, I guess, is what you would say. And what's unusual about it is, if you're familiar with how Husker Du's recorded output started. It was the Land Speed record. That was a, a scorching, hardcore, scream fest. No song is longer than like a minute and a half. It's just a blur, you know, a flurry of just activity and it's super crazy. So you figure if that's their first album and then they gradually got more melodic as their the career went on, then their really early stuff must be like that too. And it's not. Their really early stuff was more catchy and it was kind of like inspired by, you could tell the Ramones and the Buzzcocks and, and what was punk rock at the time in the late 70s, um, mixed in with their own sort of unique worldview. They did start to have a little bit of that in the early days where you could tell they were a little bit different, even though musically they kind of sounded pretty simple and kind of basic. So half these recordings are probably on like a boom box in a room some of them are done live in front of an audience recorded uh, by their official sound guy at the time their sound engineer i think his name was like terry katzman or something and um some of these are studio sessions that were just never used and then of course the previously released material now there's a bonus uh record or cd that i did not get called extra circus which contains outtakes from their EP Metal Circus and the cover is inverted from the way the Metal Circus one is done, which is a black and white picture reversed. They put the color picture back up regular. So it, it, it's pretty cool and I'm sad that I didn't get it and I'll probably end up getting one on eBay or seeing if I can find somebody that, that has an extra or something. But um, I, I fucked up. That was because I didn't order it right away because I just thought I didn't understand how limited it was going to be. So, my cautionary tale on this is is twofold. One, if the only way you can find it is the CD box and the vinyl is just completely out of the price range because now it, it's it's really limited and it's hard to get, get the CD box. That's caveat one, but it, the vinyl is preferred. The packaging is way cooler. Number two is the music. If you're familiar with Husker Du from, say, you know, Candy Apple Grey or Warehouse Songs and Stories, even Flip Your Wig, this is going to be very, very different to you. Again, 
50% of this is extreme hardcore, you know? So uh, if you're not familiar with that side of Who's Gerdu, this is going to be a bit of a shock to you. But it's worth it alone for all the unreleased material. A lot of this stuff, you know, the name Savage Young Do actually comes from an old bootleg tape that used to be circulating with pre, you know, um, land speed record tunes on it. So I used to have that tape. Some of these songs I was familiar with, but they still managed to dig up a whole lot of extra tracks that had never been even on the original Savage Young Do cassette. So it is pretty cool. I guess what I would say is this is a band that went on to great things. They weren't great at this point yet. They're heading towards greatness. But if you're someone like me who really, lo when you love a band, you want to know, you want to hear everything and you want to get to their origins, like really when they first met and they first started playing together, what were their first musical instincts, what were their first impulses, their first ideas, you get a whole hell of a lot in this. And like I said, it's hit or miss. Um, Greg Norton sang a whole lot more back in the day. It wasn't just Bob and Grant, who most people know about, as in all of the classic Who's Du songs, is either a Bob Mould song or a Grant Hart song. Um, in their earlier hardcore days, Greg was more of a, a singer at that point, too. And it, it's it, even on Land Speed Record, it's sometimes hard, sometimes hard to tell who's singing sometimes between Grant and Greg, because sometimes uh, when you're just screaming, you know, your voices kind of sound all the same. <laughs> Now, Bob Mould has been screaming for a lot longer than that, so I'm more used to his scream, so I, I can tell when it's him, but um, yeah, that's another thing of note. So anyways, I think this is a cool set. Die Hard, for, for real fans of Who's Du, you're going to want to get this, and hopefully you already did, because I don't know how limited it is, but I don't think it's going to be around forever. It's, it's from, from that standpoint, from a serious fan standpoint, it's worth getting. In the street where you shuffled your shoes, staring up sinking down into blues my soul and cigarette were signing a truce and it made me okay the only other brand new thing i got is this record here called milano okay and it's from it's a new collaboration between uh danielle lupi and uh parquet courts okay Daniel Lupi is a, uh, an Italian composer and arranger, and he's worked with artists like the Red Hot Chili Peppers and some other artists. He does a lot of arranging. And Parquet Courts are, of course, a New York City indie rock band. Now, when I got the record, I was sort of like, well, I love Parquet Courts, but I don't even know who this Daniel Lupi is. I had to Google him or look him up on Wikipedia or whatever. And then I was like, wait, I, I, maybe I, I've heard of this guy. And I went through my CD collection and I found that I did already have something with him. This is a collaboration he did called Rome, which was him and Danger Mouse, okay? And Jack White sa sang on a bunch of songs and so did Nora Jones. They were the two vocalists on this record. And I remember it being pretty good. So I was like, oh, okay, th that's the guy, right? So I already was familiar with him. So in this case, rather than working with a hip-hop producer, he works with a New York City indie band, and <clears throat> they've collaborated on this, on this project, which is really, really great. It's infinitely listenable, it's fun if you like indie rock, if you like it a little bit weirder, with like a 60s kind of exotic vibe to it a little bit, maybe a little bit of European weirdness, because the guy's Italian, uh, Italian composer. You know, that's again. And then, in addition to Parquet Quartz vocalist singing, Karen O oh from the Yeah 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 sings on about half the songs. So whoever this guy is, Daniel Lupi, and forgive my ignorance, guys, I have no idea who the fuck the guy is, but he obviously has some pretty connected friends. He knows Danger Mouse, he knows Karen O, oh, he knows Jack White, he knows um, you know all these people. So that is pretty cool. So uh, I've been playing the song Talisa, which features Karen O oh on my show the last couple weeks, but this is really good. And if you've been if you're familiar with Parquet Courts, who are sort of like a throwback to early uh, 90s lo-fi music like Pavement. Um, this, is a, a, this is a great addition to their catalog. So I am recommending it. It's called Milano. 
So I was at Half Price Books, picked up a couple of records, show them really quickly. This one's called All Them Chicks at the Hot Volume 1. And this is all sort of obscure girl groups from, it says it was all tracks recorded 1958 to 1963. Printed in 2015 by Wiggy Records, manufactured in the EU, limited to 500 copies. So this is all early 60s, very simple uh, rock and roll, pop music, whatever, by a bunch of obscure women that, you know, maybe they're not that obscure, but to me, I mean, I know some of that stuff, but I've never heard of, of you know, Pat Molitary, Terry and Peggy, Susan Summers, Cheryl, Cheryl Townsend. <laughs> Lori Davis, Jamie Jamie Horton, Joyce Davis. So I just didn't know. I knew some of these songs, but I wasn't familiar with the artist. It's this is a fun collection. I paid. Uh, let's see, it's discounted to five bucks. Still in the shrink, obviously, brand new. Okay, added another Blue Oyster Cult to my collection. This is their 1983 record called The Revolution by Night. Now I have all of their 70s records now, and I just started getting into the early 80s with, uh, with Fire of Unknown Origin. And uh, that one's the one that had Burning For You, and that was a, a big hit for them, big record. This is the follow-up to that. And I have to say that it is nowhere near as good as that record. And the main problem is 80s production is dragging this, this record down. Now when I initially looked at it, I saw one, it's produced by Bruce Fairburn, who people know later on went on to be like a big producer for like Bon Jovi and all that stuff. But this was, this predates that because there was no, well Bon Jovi probably existed technically, but whatever. The point is, he was largely an unknown producer at the time. But all of his lame tendencies that we found out later on in the 80s and his style is all fucking over this record. That is one big pile of shit. Now when I looked at it um, initially, I didn't recognize any of the songs at all. So I was like, oh, no hits on this one. Not exactly true. When I put it on, I did recognize the song Shooting Shark. Um, and Shooting Shark I used to hear on the radio all the time as a kid. So 1983, I was 12. I spent a lot of time listening to the radio. When I wasn't at school, I pretty much was at home listening to the radio. And I remembered this because Z92 used to play Blue Oyster Cult, and I remembered hearing the song Shooting Shark. So it was a moderate radio hit at the time. It just didn't leave a huge impression on me in terms of the title. Interesting note though, when I looked up the credits on this one on Shooting Shark, it was written by Buck Dharma from the band and co-written with Patti Smith. Now, a lot of people are like, what? Patti Smith, Blue Oyster Cult? No, she was actually considered uh, 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 to be a, a contender for lead singer of the Blue Oyster Cult. So she's very close with them. She's written lyrics for them in the past. I couldn't tell you which songs in particular, but I didn't know she was doing it once she was already famous in her own right. This is 1983. Patti Smith had already was, was the Patti Smith that everyone knows. So it's interesting that she was still working with other people collaborating with Blue Oyster Cult. So actually, you know, Shooting Shark is okay. The rest of this record is pretty bland. I still love Blue Oyster Cult, but this is, I think, when they began their decline. I'm going to keep collecting through the 80s. I think I'm going to stop when I get to the 90s and what they're currently doing, because I don't even know who's in the band anymore, and it's sort of like it's Blue Oyster Cult in name only, and so I'm not sure I'm going to continue. But if you are a BOC fan and you know of some records beyond, say, 1988, 89, that I should maybe check out, I'm open to some recommendations, but I'm just uh, not quite there yet. Okay, the last uh, vinyl I got here is uh, Chuck Berry Sings the Blues. This was discounted to $9.99, brand new, awesome. It's on the uh, Not Now Music label, says it was released in 2015. Of course, these are all songs from 19... It, it dates back to... Uh, this says 1950, I find that to be incorrect. I mean, I, I, that must be 1960, it's a typo. Because these are like 1955, 1956, through about 1960, and there's one of them that says recorded 1950. And I, I that has to be incorrect. Um, the only ones you maybe know, I mean, Wee Wee Hours, he used to play all the time, that's pretty well known. Sweet 16, uh, a couple others. But for the most part, um, these are not songs that you would see on like the Great 28, which is the 
the classic Chuck Berry greatest hits with 28 perfect songs that if you, you probably only need those 28 and you could be pretty happy. But me, I go way beyond that. I try to get as much Chuck Berry as I can. This is probably my 10th LP that I've got from him. So another cool set. No idea about the source material or whatever, but it, it sounds good for 1950s recordings. I mean, you know, it's it, you can't really expect uh, it to sound like a fucking ELO record or something. I also picked up a couple of used CDs. Show them real quickly. You got The Police and Yada Mandata. I've owned this in one sh form or another since it came out back in 1981. Uh, 1982 actually so I was 11 when it came out I remember initially I had it on cassette because I got it from the Columbia House tape club you know and I remember the spine the little pink line on the top of the names and everything. okay and the way they used to put the the album artwork all small on the cassette and leave big white space on top of each it was so fucking lame because it was like when you'd have your tape and your friends had the tape that they bought at the store and you got yours for a penny and you look like you're drinking like ghetto soda and they're drinking coke or whatever it's like you, they ghettoized the tapes it was super stupid but anyways moving on so i've I haven't put this album on in a really long time, and when I played it, I was like, God damn, this is so good. I mean, the police were just exceptional, and I've heard this album 500 times. It still is so, so, so good. I mean, there's just never been anyone like these guys, and uh, uh, man, still great. So this is from a, a UK band called The Bevis Frond, and it's a collection that came out last year called New Riverhead. It has songs going back to the 1980s when the band formed. Um, I was the band I've always wanted to check out. I knew a little bit about the main guy's name is Nick Solomon, but honestly, the main reason I know who they are is because I'm a fan of Mary Lou Lord. And on Mary Lou Lord's uh, debut album, um, I'll, I'll probably show a picture of it because I have it framed and signed and stuff by Mary Lou. But anyways, she did the song "He'd Be a Diamond." by the Bevis Frond, and so that's where I first heard of it, and I've heard her talk about them before, but I'd never really listened to much of their music, so this is a collection of some of their better stuff, and it does have He'd Be a Diamond. Yeah, I mean, just one quick pass-through, and I really liked it. I mean, he does have a little tendency to jam a little bit. There's a 16-minute song, there's a 7-minute song, there's a seven, another 7-minute, seven so you know me in long songs. It's just like, dude, get to the point and get out. But... He jams a little bit, but uh, still, Bevis Fron is pretty solid anyways. And then last, I picked up the Sinead O'Connor. I just felt like giving this a listen, you know? She's been in the news a lot lately for acting crazy and also for, um, you know, her serious mental health issues, uh, claiming she was going to kill herself and everything, and uh, thankfully that, that didn't happen. <clears throat> But, you know, I, I'm obsessed with Fiona Apple, and she does have a YouTube channel, and I watch her videos sometimes that she makes, and some of them are just, she makes her own videos for her own songs, or just syncs, like, sporting events to her something. I mean, just some dumb shit, but then some of it is really interesting. And right about the time of this Fiona Apple, uh, I'm sorry, right about the time of the Sinead O'Connor, um, that she was in the news the last time for, for, you know, maybe committing suicide or whatever, or talking about it, Fiona made a video where it was just her with her laptop open watching a Sinead O'Connor live concert and freaking out how much she loved it and uh, and saying how much of a hero Sinead O'Connor was to her and how much she, you know, loved Sinead O'Connor and if you need someone to talk to, you know, give me a call and all this. <clears throat> and it was cool and I was just kind of like, you know what? I, I'm familiar with Sinead O'Connor. She's obviously was a big star at one point in the early 90s, late 80s, early 90s. But um, I don't really own any of her stuff. This was her major album, you know, the one with Nothing Compares to You. Um, and I, I listened to it, and uh, I did like it. It was much better than I, than I thought it was. Um, and I now see why, <clears throat> why people were so into her before. I just, I just didn't get it at the time, but now I, I think I do get it. So there you go, and that's it, everybody. So uh, thanks a lot for watching. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.